Hello, my name is Doug Holland. I'm the owner and instructor at the Holland Reflexology Institute in Ohio. My students ask me, what is reflexology? Reflexology is a unique modality that uses pressure from the thumb and fingers to strike reflexes in the feet that detect congestion, unlock and reopen communication, and impart the need for responsible action of all body members to achieve homeostasis. Okay, first we want to make sure that we re-emphasize what thumb driving is. If you remember in class, we want to always make sure that the thumb is in the forward motion when walking. We want to make sure that it never goes linear or flat, that there's always a slight bend, and we want to use as much of our wrist and our forearm as possible in the driving motion. Okay, so again, as we're, let's say we're walking across here, we want to make sure that we don't backslide our finger. We don't want to hook it backwards or drive it backwards. Always in the forward motion when we're walking across the, the, the feet themselves. But same thing with the finger. We want to make sure we stay in the forward motion, just like that. We never want to pull back, hooking back, grabbing back. It's always in the forward motion. Make sure there's almost like a skin fold that's right in front of the skin. Now, when it comes to the thumb, the majority of the time, you're going to be on the axis of the thumb, on the medial axis. So when you put your thumb against the skin, there should be a slight bend to it as you're coming across. Notice the lateral aspect of my thumb is exposed as I'm coming across the, the uh, feet here. Okay, lateral aspect. Notice how I'm driving with my wrist too. I'm not just simply walking with my hand. Some schools teach you just simply use your hand in the walking motion. But I think torque is needed to drive deeper into the tissue. That requires wrist and forearm motion, or what we call wrenching. Okay, So we want to make sure we wrench and we walk at the same time. That's going to take practice. Walking across the metatarsal heads here, in this example, and then driving at the same time. We're going to go ahead and discuss pressure again. Thumb pressure, finger pressure on the reflexes. Remember, it is, it's force, distance, over time. Now depending on how much force you use, how, much, how big of an area linearly that you pass over, and the amount of time that it takes you will make the difference of whether uh, you strike the reflexes appropriately. And these can be done in thousands of combinations. Force, the depth in the skin, distance, how far you go, and how quickly you go. Either quick, or slow. Force, distance, time. Okay, now we're going to go over some basic stretching techniques. Uh, the first one I'd like to discuss is the extension movement, also known as the tarsal stretch. And basically what we want to do is we want to stretch the major bones of the foot, the seven major bones, also known as tarsals. Now the way that we do that is, is that we're going to pull this foot in a straight line or a linear motion away from the larger extremity which would be the leg in this case and both hands are going to act as a working hand neither are going to be just simply holding hands but both are going to act as a working hand now we're going to use the left foot in this demonstration the first thing we want to do is put the right hand over the dorsal aspect of the foot and about the mid body of the foot then we're going to take the left hand and we're going to place it underneath so that's on the, the, the plantar pad of the hand is on the medial aspect of the uh, calcaneus. Now what we do is, is we're going to pull in a straight motion backwards or away from the client. What we don't want to do is plantar flex the foot, which is very discomforting to the client, nor dorsal flex by pulling the heel only. We want to make sure that we pull the heel along with this part of the foot, the mid-body, straight back. Now, Notice I'm pulling it straight back. We're going to do a hold for about 10 seconds. And while we're doing that, we're not going to twist the foot in any other way. We're just going to bring it straight back. Now, when we hold it for 10 seconds, the body's going to defend itself, and the leg is going to naturally want to pull itself back. That's good. Because what we're going to do is we're going to slowly release the pressure, and just when the body starts to think it's over, we're going to quickly pull back. All right, that's going to give it its maximum stretch. We do not want to start the 
exercise by just simply jerking the foot backwards. That's no good. We want to pull the foot, allow for a nice deep stretch for about 10 seconds, and as we release and the body let, for, lets go, then we pull it back. Okay? When we do that, then we go ahead and release the motion and then let, let the hands off. So that's what we call the tarsal stretch or the extension movement. Now the next stretch that I would like to show you is what we call metatarsal stretching, adduction and abduction. A-D-D-U-C-T-I-O-N or abduction, A-B-D-U-C-T-I-O-N. The first we'll try is adduction, which is moving towards the medium or the middle center. Now the way we do that is, is we place the left hand over the dorsal aspect of the foot, then we take the right palm of the right hand and we place that along the plantar heads of the uh, metatarsal bones or the transverse arch. So we go ahead and we place it like this. Now notice how we interlock the fingers. The fingers are interlocked over the side and as we lock them down we begin to squeeze on the top and the bottom of the foot and then we go ahead and we slowly twist in an adduction motion. Adduction towards the middle of the center. Now we continue to rotate until we start to feel some pretty good resistance. Once we feel that resistance we stop for a brief second, wait till the body quits defending itself and then move, just rotate a little bit more. We don't want to over rotate, it will hurt the client. We just want to get to where there's a good stretch there. Hold for 10 to 12 seconds. Then we want to go ahead and release that stretch. To do abduction, which is away from the median center, then we want to put the right hand over the dorsal aspect, left hand on the plantar surface, and again interlock the fingers. When we do that, then we go ahead and we begin to twist in an abduction formation until we feel, again, resistance. What we do not want to have is over rotation on either of the two stretches. We don't pull the foot towards us, we don't push it too far away, let it sit in its natural position and twist. That twisting right there really stretches the metatarsal heads and the metatarsal bones and ligaments and everything that's in, you know, muscles that's in between. The digitorum especially uh, and the flexor halicus longus get a really good stretch in this, in this particular exercise. Then we release and we allow the foot to relax. That's what we call abduction, adduction, stretching of the metatarsal heads. Okay, now we're going to show the exercise metatarsal wrenching. Metatarsal wrenching is the most difficult exercise to learn. It'll take you the most time and it requires a lot of hand strength. Um, one thing that we want to pay uh, close attention to when you're doing this particular exercise is that both hands work equally together. Neither will be a holding hand, both will be working hands. Of course, your, your one hand will work harder than the other depending on what foot you're on. But here's how we do metatarsal wrenching. We're going to use the right foot in this example. We're going to take my left hand, my left planter pad, and I'm going to put it directly across the metatarsal heads of the right foot. They're going to be evenly across one another. You'll feel there's a nice firm hold that just, just natural pressure that foot wants to grip. Too high on the toes, your hand will come off. Too low and the toes hook over. So we want to make sure that that hand is pressing against the plantar pad of that foot perfectly, or the, the uh, metatarsal heads. Reach the, the fingers right across the top of the toes. Do not squeeze them and do not hold them too loosely. Just gently do a firm hold on those toes. The right working hand is going to have its, the index finger is going to go right between the, the talus bone and the navicular. The, the thumb is going to hook around right to the superior aspect of the plantar pad of the foot. So we're going to hook all the way around and we're going to let the other fingers gently just sit on top of the shin bone. See? Nice and, nice and relaxed. Now, both hands are going to oppose each other. One is going to work abduction and the other one's going to work in adduction and then vice versa. So the, one hand will turn, twist in, the other hand will twist out. Do not pull the foot towards you or away from you let it sit naturally as you twist one direction to the other. Notice my thumb is free. It's not even using any pressure at all. Twist in opposite directions. Now, 
as I twist in opposite directions, I'm going to slide the right hand up the foot. Okay, see how I'm sliding it up the foot? Now I'm doing this in slow motion as I'm sliding to give you an idea of how they oppose one another. But now notice how I do it with a little bit of finesse. I'm rocking my hands and I'm going up. So this, this hand touches the other working hand. See how we go up? It's never in a down motion. It's always an upward sweeping motion that we do this. We perform this exercise. So twist, twist, twist. Metatarsal wrenching. It's like wrenching a towel. See, you wrench a towel, you, 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 you wrench it against each other, right? You don't squeeze it in the same direction when you're wrenching. When you're wrenching a towel, so the same thing with metatarsal wrenching of the foot. Okay? Sweeping upward motion. If we do this properly, new students will do this. They'll be very jerky. That's okay. You're learning. But the idea is to be a nice sweeping motion. You'll learn how to relax muscles in your hands. You'll learn how to, this one to give, and this sometimes this one to relax, so that that foot has a wonderful sweeping motion as you wrench the foot. Okay, now we're going to demonstrate digital dorsal flexing and Achilles stretching. The way we're going to do this is we're going to use the palm of the plantar pad against the metatarsal, metatarsal phalangeal joint. You'll notice that when we pull the, the toes back on this particular exercise, we call this digital dorsal flexing because we're stretching the digits and allowing the metatarsal phalangeal joints to protrude. And they protrude noticeably. Notice how the skin along this transverse area is white. That's because I'm forcing all the blood out by pushing the toes backward. Pushing the toes backward is generally never uncomfortable. Usually it's a good feeling. You never want to pull back on the toes, which we call plantar flexing. You plantar flex these toes too far, that's very uncomfortable to the client. So we always want to make sure that the stretch is in a dorsal fashion or towards the body itself. And this makes it good for in the future when you're working certain reflexes that you can actually get it. This, you wouldn't want to do this on a new client, but it's excellent for getting in between the metatarsal heads when you're doing that. But the way you do this particular exercise, the holding hand goes underneath the foot and holds nice and gently between the calcaneus and the tailbone. And we're going to go ahead and we're just going to push the foot dorsally and back. And then we're going to push the toes back. And then we're going to go ahead and just push our palm in there, like this. And then we're going to push the toes back. It's a, what we call digital dorsal flexing. So it's more than just the Achilles, because you know we're engaging the Achilles all the way to the gastrocnemius, which is the calf muscle. As we push back, we're getting a good Achilles stretch. We're getting a great stretch. Even the flexor hallucis longus is being stretched in this particular stretch. So this is an excellent stretch to do on your clients before you get involved in ankle rotations and those other things. And then to do the final part of the stretch, just simply push the toes over. Now notice I have all the toes. I'm not letting one slide off or the other. I'm getting a hold of all toes in the stretch. And I'm not squeezing with my fingers. I'm just using it to hold. You don't want to sit there and pinch those toes off from the other side. That's what we call digital dorsal flexing and Achilles stretching. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and demonstrate how to do the hand drill. Like you learned in class, the hand drill comes from an ancient form of fire starting with two sticks on, on dry wood. The way we're going to perform the, the hand drill is we're going to use the right and left hand. The planter pad of both hands is going to come in contact with the foot. The planter pad of the left hand is going to come in contact with the first metatarsal head of the medial aspect of the left foot, and it's going to come in the right hand, the planter pad is going to come in contact with the fifth metatarsal protrusion of the lateral aspect of the left foot. It'll feel as if they're in the saddle on both sides of the hands. You don't want to be too high and you don't want to be too low in the foot when performing this exercise. You want to make sure that both of those bones fit right in the saddle of both of the hands. We simply drive the hands left and right, back and forth, and as we drive the hands back and forth, we engage the metatarsal uh, stretching. 
It also stretches the ankles, it stretches the toes, it stretches just about everything. But again, do not let the hand slide up too high and that way you're banging just the toes or too low and you're not getting any movement in there. Now the fingers should be slapping the dorsal aspect of this foot when you're doing it. it should slap the dorsal aspect. So when you're twisting back and forth, you can hear the hands actually hitting the dorsal aspect of the foot. Now it requires shoulder strength. You want to keep your elbows a little higher than normal. You'll feel your trapezius engaged the longer you do this. Most people can only handle about 20 to 30 seconds. Most practitioners can only handle about 20 to 30 seconds before their arms start to you know, feel a little sore. But that's an excellent stretch to do on just about everybody unless they have gout or some other major issue with their foot. Now we're going to go over another difficult technique that's probably as difficult as metatarsal wrenching. Uh, we call it the metatarsal wave. Again, this is another metatarsal exercise. It's designed to, to bring fluidity between the metatarsal bones. This particular exercise requires both hands, again, being working hands. Neither will be just simply holding. And the way that this particular exercise works, it's like a wave. That's why we call it the metatarsal wave, because it's a wave-like motion. And the way that we perform this particular uh, reflex, or not reflex, but stretching, is we place both hands on either side of the foot with the thumbs on the first and fifth metatarsal heads. The fingers should, should relax gently over the dorsal aspect of the foot and come in contact with one another. So again, the first and fifth metatarsal heads is where the thumbs are, and the fingers rest gently over the dorsal aspect. Now, here's how this particular exercise works. We're going to push in with our thumbs, and notice how the transverse part of the arch dorsal flexes. Notice how it dorsal flexes. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is, when we dorsal flex that, we are going to pull the right hand around and then elongate the entire transverse arch. It's elongated, but it's See, at now, an angle. Then we're going to repress the right thumb back in there. We're going to pull the left hand down and back, and then we're going to elongate it in the opposite direction. Then we'll bring it back in and elongate it in the opposite act angle here. So what happens is, is when I press in and elongate, it creates a wave. Press in, elongate. Can you see the wave in there? There's the wave. It's pressing and pulling, pressing and pulling. Okay, And you'll become more fluid with it as, as you rock the feet. So at no given time should both thumbs, well you can see they, they're kind of to get pressed in together at this time, but there should be a fluid mo motion. There should be a fluid motion on how the foot moves, like a wave. And you'll always go from one side to the other. You'll never try to go back. I'm doing it in reverse right now. It's, it's much more difficult to go medial to lateral. It's much easier to go lateral to medial in this particular motion here. You don't pull the foot plantar flex it or dorsal flex it. Just keep it nice and, and loose and go ahead and do that stretch. If you get too deep, you're not going to get any move, movement there if you go too high. You're not going to get the right movement. You're just going to bang the toes around. Make sure you keep these two thumbs right on the first and fifth metatarsal bone. That way, when you press and, and, and twist, you get that nice fluid motion. That's metatarsal wave. Okay, now we're going to demonstrate hanging the saddle. And basically, we're going to use our thumbs to hold the feet up in the most relaxing position. And this is always done at the end of a treatment. Okay? And it's real simple. There's a saddle or a depression right below the second and third metatarsal heads. It's right in the transverse part of the arch. But you can feel there's a soft spot. Everybody has that soft spot right here. Both thumbs engage the soft spot. And the best way to do it is now you can't hold the, the feet this way and, and hold the depression. I do that a lot of times. But there's even a nicer way. If you twist the thumbs around, you'll find that they lock in that nice little soft spot 
and you can lift the feet up gently. See how I'm lifting up the feet real gently? Lift it up and you hold that position. This is the solar plexus diaphragm reflex area. And basically what this does is it relaxes the legs, it relaxes the whole body, it feels very comfortable to the client when you're finished with the, the whole thing. You can also feel a plantar pulse that will come from a throbbing on the bottom of the feet. If I feel that throbbing, I know that the client's legs are completely and utterly relaxed from the treatment. But notice how I'm holding it up. I'm not pushing in too deep with my thumbs. I'm not driving them in real deep. You can hold it this way too. Okay, let the foot, the feet rest down in this position. That's okay. But the different positions that you hold, if you let the weight of the feet come, you know you're definitely in that saddle. We call it hanging the saddle. And that's an excellent way to finish up a client treatment. Okay, now we're going to discuss how to do the hallux reflex. This is the most dominant reflex in the human body. Uh, it also can be the most painful. So when a practitioner exercises this particular uh, reflex, they must do this with care. Now the way we perform this particular reflex is, is we are going to use the interphalangeal joint of both the index finger and the second digit. And what we're going to do is we're going to hook it between the hallux, which is the great toe, in between the second digit. Okay. The metatarsal interphalangeal joint is, or they call the metatarsal phalangeal joint, is the closest proximal spot that we want both of our fingers to be. So as deep as you can drive these two fingers into the tissue is where our starting point is for the amygdala reflex. Now, how does this perform? We're going to squeeze both knuckles on the base side of the hallux. Now I'm applying pressure inwardly on both of the fingers. This squeezing, this alone can cause a client some pain. But how we will do this, we're going to use the holding hand, we're going to slide it up underneath the foot so we have a, rest, a resting place for the foot to be. And I'm going to begin twisting abduction and adduction as I go up the toe. Okay? As I go up the toe, I'm twisting back and forth and I'm applying pressure all the way to the most distal aspect of the toe. So from the very base to the most distal aspect is a rotation of my fingers to the very top. Now the more pressure you apply from the medial to the lateral aspect to the top will create more pain. But that's the way that the hallux uh, twist is performed. Again, both fingers wrap around the toe. You drive back and forth until you come to the very top. Now, it seems to be that the most sensitive part gets to be right around the interphalangeal joint of the hallux itself. As you get more towards the, the di most distal aspect, it's not as bad. But as the most dominant reflex, I try to wait to the second or third round before I reach this. Once you strike the most dominant reflex in a body, everything else in the foot becomes available. Then the true internal diagnostics of the human body uh, become available for work. Now, give me your other foot, Lori. We're going to demonstrate a double hallux uh, reflex. What we're going to, I do this at the very end. I would never do this in the beginning. But we'll grab both toes the exact same way. See, we have both toes. And we'll begin twisting and applying pressure as we go all the way up. Now, Lori's not really prepared for this because we're shooting this video, and so it's hurting her a lot. I would make sure that before I did this, I would have, I'd never do this on a new client, but uh, as, the, as our experienced clients have their feet done, they're more ready and available for this by the second round, or when I increase my power level to two. There's, as you know, there's three levels of power. As I uh, apply the pressure of three levels of pressure, the second level of pressure is when I would start maybe working these reflexes properly. Because without working the hallux reflex, you're not going to get anything else done properly. You just won't. Okay, now we're going to demonstrate how to perform the hypothalamus pituitary pineal reflex. Why are they all together? Well, anatomically, they're all together. They're very close in proximity to one another. 
So again, it's the hypothalamus pituitary pineal reflex. This is a very painful reflex when you're working on people, so you must be careful. We have a special way of doing it at the Holland Reflexology Institute, and it's in my book. Um, I don't try to do as much in the hooking technique. I prefer more of a, of, of a sliding of the hand and a twisting of the hand. Now, I hope the camera can get this properly because my elbow is probably going to get right in the way. So I'm going to have to probably do it just a little bit different so that my elbow doesn't get too far in the way of the, of the exercise. But here's what we do. If you take your thumb and you look at the, if you look at the toe, they almost match up with one another. So if I take the interphalangeal joint of my thumb and I put it at the most proximal aspect of the hallux, it fits in like a glove. You notice that? kind of just fits in there nice and snug. Well, the cool part about that is it doesn't matter what size a person's thumb is, unless you're extraordinarily small in stature, that thumb should reach almost the middle of the hallux. Isn't that neat? It fits right there. So you don't have to kind of guess where that reflex is going to be, but it sits right there. Now, what do we do? We take the holding hand, we take the index finger, and we apply pressure. See, I'm, I'm acting as a leverage. I'm pushing back. The thumb is pushing forward, and they meet together in the middle. So you don't want to push too far plantar or dorsal flex. Keep it right in the middle. Now here's the great part about this. I'm simply going to bend my thumb. When I bend my thumb, I'm dead smack in the hypothalamus pituitary pineal reflex. Now all I have to do is simply twist my hand. And as I twist my hand, I'm striking the reflex. I'm causing this reflex to strike. Now I'm going to raise my elbow real high so you can see. Now all I have to do is slightly hook the finger at the top and raise the toe and I got maximum pressure on the hypothalamus pituitary pineal reflex. And I do the opposite, I slide the hand down. It's a torquing up, it's a torquing down. And I'm striking the reflex. Okay? This is one of the very few times that I believe in, in, in grabbing, hooking, sliding, twisting on a reflex instead of just simply thumb driving. I'm twisting. And I'm going up and down, just like this. Is that clear? That's the way you want to do it. And if you want to do a little extra special attention, as you're at the very top, you simply drive up and hook. And when you do that, you get the maximum drive of that reflex. Now, be aware, you do that to a client that's new, they'll come flying out of that seat. it would be very uncomfortable to them. So we want to break somebody in very slowly, maybe the third or fourth visit before you start performing this type of a reflex, strongly like in a range of, of the uh, third level of pressure. Anyways, again, that's the hypothalamus pituitary pineal reflex strike. Okay, now we're going to discuss how to work the trapezius reflex. There are many different trapezius movements. We have anterior, posterior, but we also, there's about three or four different exercises, so we're going to start at one at a time. First, we're going to start with working the anterior aspect, and we call this the trapezius ridge or the trapezius walk or walking the ridge. Walking the ridge is what I came up with because it, you know, if you look at this part of the foot, the anatomical structure of the foot, this is where the trapezi anterior trapezius lies, right through here. Now we know that the toes also are incorporated in anterior trapezius, posterior trapezius, but if we're looking at the plantar aspect, on the plantar aspect, we see there's a ridge here. That ridge, I want to walk that ridge, and I want to get between each and every one of these bones where the phalanx meets the metatarsal head. Okay? So we want to get in there. This can be quite painful to a new person. So when we first walk the ridge on somebody new, we kind of want to just scour the surface. But as we get a more advanced client, we want to get deeper and deeper in between these metatarsal bones. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to use the holding hand, similar to what I'm doing, just to stabilize the foot. Find a comfortable way of holding this foot so that it remains stable. We don't want to see any adduction or adduction of the foot, any articulation of it side to side. We simply want the foot stable. Now, I'm going to take the working hand. I'm going to take the thumb of the working hand, and I'm going to start at the most lateral aspect of the foot, right on the bony protrusion of the fifth metatarsal head. See, there's that little bone. I'm going to stick it right in there. Then I'm going to begin to walk. This is one of the very few times you will not see me wrenching my wrist. 
Notice I'm not wrenching my wrist because I have a new person here. So you have a new person, so I'm just basically using my thumb. If I was to wrench my wrist and drive, we're going to get a way worse reaction on the end of the client. You're going to get really deep into the subcutaneous layer. So we're just going to simply walk the ridge nice and gently, okay? And that way we're striking the anterior aspect of the trapezius. That's walking the ridge. I only work medial or uh, lateral to medial. Lateral to medial. On either foot, it doesn't matter. Lateral to medial. You're never going to come back this way because it's just too uncomfortable for the hand. I mean, you can do it, but see how the halx is getting in my way? Bang, bang. That's a pain in the butt. So what we're going to do is we are going to walk the ridge from lateral to medial. And the more experienced you are and the more experienced your client is, I want to see you get very deep to the base of that, the most uh, proximal place of those phalanxes. I want, I want you to be deep in those phalanxes, actually between each of the toes. You'll get to the point where you're down in between these toes, way in there when you're walking the ridge. So it won't be just simply going lateral to medial. You'll be going in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out, all the way until you get to the hallux. Now, since we're on the anterior aspect of the trapezius, let's go ahead and we'll demonstrate anterior trapezius up and anterior trapezius down. Let's start with anterior trapezius up. Now, I'm for, for the sake of the camera, I have to work opposite hands. So I'm going to put my holding hand here and make sure there's a firm hold on these. And I'm going to work with, a, with my thumb. I'm going to start at the base of the ridge and I'm going to work up the toe, just walking my thumb to the very top. Now notice I went straight up the medium plane. The medium plane or medial plane, either way you want to say it. But I, I'm working right up the medium plane of that toe to the most distal aspect. Now I can start on the medial side or the lateral side. I'm trying to do this for the camera, it's not easy. The lateral side of this toe, and I can get even a greater reaction. But for our starters, let's just focus. I'm going to try to pull this one toe back so you can see. Let's just focus on working the medial or the uh, the most plantar surface of this toe all the way up. Then we're going to make sure we work each and every toe all the way across. Now normally I do it this way. I use this hand. Oh, let me see if I can try to do it. I use this thumb and this hand all the way up. See how that blood gets to the very most distal aspect? Isn't that great? And then I'll come all the way across to the top. And I'll do the next toe all the way up to the top. And I'll do the next toe all the way to the top. And I'll do the next toe all the way to the top. Now I'm going very fast here. But again, you can go medial center, lateral, medial center, lateral, medial center, lateral, on all them when you get a more advanced client. Now, let's do an anterior trapezius down. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to hold the feet, and I'm going to take my thumb, and I'm going to work my way down. Now, this time I'm using more of a wrist motion. You notice that? See, I'm not just walking my thumb down. I'm actually wrenching my wrist to aid the thumb as I go down the toes. Okay, all the way down. Now I must, I'm using a little bit of pressure to demonstrate, and of course the client here is, is feeling it and jerking their foot, but that, that makes it more realistic when you have somebody that's new to reflexology. Okay, so again, as a recap for anterior, we have the ridge, okay, we have the ridge, we have anterior up, and anterior down. So do we have that? Good. Now, now we're going to focus on going over to posterior aspect of the trapezius. Okay, so now we're going to focus on the posterior aspect of the trapezius, and that lies from here all the way across the top of these uh, toes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my thumb, okay, and I'm going to get my thumb to get right up behind the, these digits. And it's going to act as a counter leverage because when I use my index finger, I'm going to walk right down the surface, the dorsal aspect of these toes. And I'm going to go all the way down, and now i got that counter lever. Now watch this, I can take my thumb off now. Once you get down to the most proximal aspect, right before you get to the metatarsal bone, it doesn't even require you to use a, a lever on the back side as a, as a counter lever. All you have to do is take the index finger and work the base. See how I'm doing that? I don't even have to put a finger behind it. But if I come up nice and high on that toe, 
well, now I need a counter lever. You know, I need something because if I don't have that, boom. Say I'm pushing the toe over, trying to do the exercise. You can't do that. Now we're plantar flexing the toe. So we need something behind there that's going to hold that toe in place so that we can work it. I have yet to figure out a way to do posterior trapezius up. So the only way I figured out how to do this so far is what I call posterior trapezius down. Working the posterior trapezius Which is digits reflexes. two through four for posterior trapezius. If once I get under the fifth digit, I'm actually in the, and, or the posterior deltoid right now. So really, this is the trapezius area. I will give credit to students that will actually go into the fifth digit because technically you really can't separate the deltoid and the trapezius that much. They really need one another. They're kissing cousins. So I will give credit for students to go all the way. To, if I say, can the fifth digit be required in the posterior trapezius exercise or anterior trapezius exercise, and a student was to mark yes, I would accept that in the testing requirement. But now this is the deltoid. The fifth digit does represent the deltoid. So it's just something to consider that we have overlapping muscles and, and it's important that we work them that way. But that's as simple as that. Okay, now we're going to do the hip sciatic reflex. It's one of the largest, it probably is the largest reflex in the entire anatomical structure. Um, when I developed my chart, I found that the hip sciatic reflex dominates pretty much the whole posterior aspect of the of the uh, foot. So what I'm going to do is first is I'm going to demonstrate first how to hold the foot with a holding hand and I'm going to demonstrate the working hand. This is one of the most unique reflexes because you can either use hooking, digging, driving, torque, press, rocking, extension with compression. You can use a lot of different ways to drive in and reach these specific reflexes. Um, first, let's discuss how we're going to hold the foot. We're going to put our working hand, we're going to switch hands, we're going to do the opposite. This is the left foot, obviously. We're going to put the left hand across the transverse plane as if we were going to dorsal flex or dorsal digit flex the foot. Now I'm going to take the working hand and I'm going to slide it up underneath. And notice how I have my fingers loose here. You can use one, two, three, four, all four fingers to work the hip sciatic reflexes. Now in this example, we're going to start with the medial aspect of the foot. I'm going to stick my fingers as, uh, as superior as possible uh, up the ankle. And it's probably just above the talus bone, the talus bone, excuse me, because depending on where you're from in the country, talus is the proper way to say it. But we're going to put my fingers as high up above the tail talus bone as possible and then I'm going to drive my fingers in and then I'm going to slide them and drive them all the way across. Okay, notice how they're moving, inching across. Now really I only have two digits involved right now. now I got three digits involved. It's very hard to get the fourth digit. I got big hands. But I can see now I'm going from su superior to inferior as I come across. Or I can hook and go antero-posterior which is going backwards towards the back or posterior anterior which is going from the back to the front see how I'm going up if this is the most distal aspect of the foot and I'm going posterior to anterior that's what we call posterior anterior I'm driving my fingers up so this is more of a driving issue if I'm coming back, it's more of a hooking issue. See, I'm hooking and I'm coming back. It's when you break the rule and I'm coming all the way back. Now, here's another cool thing. I can switch hands and go into a normal digit dorsal flexion. And I can take my fingers and I can simply drive superior. See, I can work my way. See how unique that is? Oh, hey, I can do something else. I can reach my left hand up underneath and I can just take the thumb and I can drive posterior anterior postero anterior right here just like that and work in the hip sciatic and I can do it in many directions superior to anterior I can come inferior or uh, superior to inferior I mean it gets to the point where you can't even describe what direction you're going to you're like a 
like a spider web, just follow it all, all the way around. I can switch fingers like this, you know. I can, I can come back underneath here and I can hook again. See, I can hook again. I, I'm driving now, I'm driving hooking. I can't even keep up with what I'm saying on myself. But anyways, this is how you can do it. Now here's one cool thing, I don't know if the camera can see this, but I'm actually gonna slide my fingers underneath the heel. See, I'm almost to the full planter pad. Sliding my fingers is another great way. This can be quite painful for people who have never had this done before. And when you're sliding, you are absolutely getting that hip sciatic to the best you can right there. That's the, that's the sweet spot right there. Now, Lori, let me have your right foot. Let's switch feet here. And I'm going to show you doing the lateral aspect of the hip sciatic. Okay, we just did medial. Now we're on the outside. Okay. Now, I'm keeping my hand out of the way so you can see me doing this. But all I'm doing is allowing her own foot weight, just the, her own weight of her foot, to go up against my fingers. Now, I'm just driving. That's all I'm doing, which means that I'm using force, distance over time. You can go fast, like this, or you can go real slow, get in there nice and deep. Now, the more I hook my fingers, the deeper the acupressure is. The, the more pain the client will feel, the deeper you strike the reflexes. This is one of the seven most dominant reflexes in the body, the hip sciatic. Okay, so I'm just driving. That's all I'm doing, I'm just driving. Now here's a really something really cool you can do. Let's say I start at the beginning position, the posterior aspect of the, uh, the heel here. My fingers are right between the talus and the calcaneus bone. I'm almost on the Achilles tendon. Almost. Not quite there. Now, let's say I was to take this foot, grab it like I was going to dorsal flex it, which I will, and now I'm going to wrench the foot in a lateral aspect, not past medial. You don't twist it this way. Just from front and center, just go ahead and laterally flex the foot. Now I'm moving my fingers up as and it, I'm, I'm moving them, uh, let's see, this would be distally or poster, posterior and anterior. I'm moving them towards the anterior surface of the foot as I move my fingers up. Now this will increase the intensity tremendously as you do this, but I'm going very light on Lori right now. But if I go with my hooking and my driving of the foot, hook drive or finger drive with the torquing of the foot, man, can you get to the reflexes that way. So let's say on a test, I, on a practical, I say I want to see you finger drive coupled with the wrenching of the foot for hip sciatic reflex. This is what I would expect you to do. Wrenching along with driving and we're just gonna go all the way up and it doesn't look like I'm doing much but that's incredible so again you can you can drive superior just like this you can drive superior on the hip sciatic you can do an extension movement this is what I'm doing I'm doing an extension I'm actually pulling on the foot see I'm pulling the foot and I'm driving I mean, there's just a million different ways you can do this, and only in class can you really get a good feel for it. But my students know what I'm talking about, so this DVD should remind you of, of, of how I want to see thumb driving, finger driving, extension, hooking of the hip sciatic reflex. And don't forget, hip sciatic goes completely underneath the heel. It's only that when we get to this part of the planter pad does the reflex change to the knee reflex. But all underneath here is complete hip sciatic. One of the most dominant reflexes of the body. Okay, now we're going to cover the spine reflex exercise. This particular technique can be done in many, many different ways. I'm just going to show you simply the basics. Uh, as we learned in class, there are 27 uh, bones of the spine, 7 cervical, 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, then we have the sacrum and coccygeal. Now, Probably the most painful to the client, especially a new one, is going to be cervicals and thoracics. That's the one that's going to really 
and get their attention, especially if we work in a um, oh, I guess across the, the, the spinal reflexes, we should say. There's a technical term for it, but it slips me right now. Well, let's start first with the seven cervical. As we know, the cervicals start right at the top of the sternum reflex. All you have to do is look at the peak of where the uh, bony protrusion of the first metatarsal head is on the medial aspect, and you know you're very close to where the cervicals will start. So as soon as I get on the superior side of that, and which would be the proximal side of the, the reflex, once I get on the superior side of that, I'm going to start walking my finger up to cervicals. I'm at seven, six, five, four, three, two, and then the very top is one. So we have one through seven. Okay. Now notice I only went, you know, pretty medially on that, didn't I? But you could come a little bit here on the inside a little bit. You could come a little bit further on the dorsal aspect. But either way. This is where the cervicals lie. Don't forget to go to the very peak, right about there, okay, on making sure you strike the reflexes. Some will use their thumb. That's okay. You want to use your thumb? That's good. Just make sure the holding hand, you know, counteracts the, the, the leverage so that, it, you know, when you're pushing with your finger, you're not pushing the foot this way. It's real easy. Notice where my thumb is on the hallux. My index finger is on the hallux. I'm just gently holding this left foot as I drive up the foot. I really have never drove down, I, I guess you could, but I, I've never really done it. Maybe as one of my students keep working at it, maybe they'll come up with a neat way to do that. Now, now let's focus on thoracics. The easiest way to remember where the thoracics are is we look at the bony protrusion of the, cal of the uh, cuboid bone. This is the cuboid bone where the fifth metatarsal head meets the cuboid. Now, there's a, a bony protrusion there if we draw a straight line across, a very straight line across, we know from that point up is the thoracics. Okay, there's 12 thoracics, so we start at 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. <laughs> it's not perfect, obviously. You don't know exactly where they're in. If you did that, you'd be a miracle worker. But we do know that right across here is where the thoracics start. Now below that point, we want to look at the plantar pad. See how the skin changes slightly here? This is where the plantar pad is. And right where the plantar pad changes its skin texture is where the lumbar start. Here's the fifth lumbar. So we look for the bony protrusion. We draw a straight line. And we look for the fifth lumbar. And we walk up. Five, four, three, two, one. So that's lumbars five through one there. Now what do we find below the fifth lumbar? We find the last two bones of the spine, the sacral, and the coccygeal. Now the interesting thing about the coccygeal when we were a young kid, that was five bones, but they fuse. But as far as chiropractors and, and uh, those in the medical field are um, involved, they look at it as two bones. Now those two bones are found just below that plantar pad. So where exactly are there? Just below the pad. I'll give credit to any student that works the last two bones as long as they're below the pad. If you're above the pad line, the plantar pad here, that's a fail. You must be below the plantar pad line to demonstrate that you know where the sacral coccygeal reflex is. So again, to, to reiterate, we have the coccygeal sacral, lumbar 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, thoracic 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 7, cervical, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. That's the spinal reflex. Now we can work it, uh, Boy, I forget the technical term at this time, but we can work it from the inferior to the superior across. Notice how I'm using my fingers this way to go across. 
I'm having a harder time doing this because I have a camera on me. Normally I like to twist my whole body around and I like to be able to hold that foot and I like to use my index finger. Notice that I'm using my second digit to hold the index finger down so the driving is good. But this can be quite painful to a new person too. But I'm driving in, inferior to superior across this transverse plane or the longitudinal plane I should say. And you could actually do this all the way up. I've never really done it on the hallux much. I guess you could. Yeah, I do. I guess I do do it. You can go right across the top of the hallux. It's just kind of hard to grip that and apply pressure. But the important thing is, is why it's good we don't use lotion. Otherwise, our fingers would just slide. Now, you can also take the dorsal aspect of your hand, place it to the plantar part of the foot, and you could work down. This would be anterior posterior in direction, anterior posterior in direction, and do the exact same thing. Some people get real fancy about it. You know, they'll have the hand and they'll slide it like this, and I don't really care about that that much. I just want to know that the reflexes are being uh, being struck. So this is how we work the spinal reflex, and. Uh, Okay, we'll go on to the next reflex. Now that we've gone over all the dominant reflexes, which were the amygdala, hypothalamus, pituitary pineal, the, the spine, the trapezius, and the hip sciatic, now we're going to go into the intermedial reflexes. And the first inter intermedial reflex, which is the most dominant of the intermedial, is the occipitalis. Now the occipitalis is the back of the head. You know people that have a lot of issues with headaches, it's going to result probably either from the sternocleidomastoid or the occipitalis as far as muscle issues. So what we're going to do is demonstrate how to do the occipitalis. It's very easy. Just simply use the holding hand, and we're using the left foot here, just use, simply use the holding hand and put your, put your thumb right to the base of the hallux, or right center of the hallux actually. So that's your counter lever. You don't want this hallux moving. And you can use the index finger to kind of hold it in there nice and snug. Now I'm going to take my index finger and I'm simply going to drive right over the surface, the dorsal surface of the hallux, right up in here. Man, this can be painful on people, so be careful. But I'm just going to drive right across. This is occipitalis. I'm working medial to lateral. I, ha I will switch. I'll go from lateral to medial, just like this, and we'll get a different reaction. And sometimes I'll even work it down. Okay, I'll even work it down. So, medial to lateral. Lateral to medial. I'm holding my hands different normally than I do because I'm trying to let the camera see. I mean, you can't see if I was to, if I'm holding my hands like this. This is normally how I do it where you can't see it. But I'm trying to hold it in such a way you can see it. But just make sure that this hallux doesn't, you know, go flying around That's when you're trying to do okay, it. Okay, now we're going to work the sternocleidomastoid. The sternocleidomastoid is a neck muscle that helps you to rotate your head from left to right. What we're going to do here is, is we're going to start on the medial aspect with the thumb. Notice how my holding hand just holds gently the hallux and the rest of the toes. I'm not squeezing too hard. I'm just gently resting my hand so that I got a hold of these toes. Because my goal is I want to deal with this hallux. So we're going to start here at the base of the sternocleidomastoid and we're going to work our way in to the lateral aspect and I'm going to slightly twist the hallux as I'm going up the side. Okay, so we work from the base, the most proximal aspect, to the most distal aspect of the sternocleidomastoid. Once I get to this point, that's the end of it. So it's across and up, across and up. You can change speed, you can go real fast, or you can go real slow, slowly working your way across and then up. That's the sternocleidomastoid. Now when somebody becomes more advanced, I want to see you twist that hallux, and you're going to get way up inside there. That's a real zinger there, that'll knock them out. You can also come down on the sterno, that's fine. You can work across and go back, across and go back. But either way, make sure that you have good leverage when you're holding the foot. Okay, now we're going to work the thyroid parathyroid. This is a pretty simple one. 
just look for the, the, the soft area that's just above the sternocleidomastoid that reaches up to the pituitary pineal hypothalamus. It's just a small target area that we want to find. It's, all, it's the neck area and we're just going to simply hold the foot the exact same way and we're just going to simply drive up to the hypothalamus pituitary. That's all we're going to do. That's thyroid, parathyroid. Right like this. See? Yep. That's a real easy one to do right there. But just hold. If you drive in too hard, it can really make them zing. So just be kind of patient with them and work your way up through there. Thyroid, parathyroid. Okay. Now we're just going to go over some of the guidelines and then we'll go over the reflexes and how to work them in the guidelines themselves. As we know, there are four guidelines that, I, that we pay attention to uh, according to the Holland Method. First is the clavicle guideline. That clavicle guideline goes from the head of the sternum all the way across to underneath the deltoid. It's a simply, it's a horizontal line. It just goes straight across straight across. So we know that when we're working anything above that or below it, this is the guideline that I can, I can hold a, a student accountable to and they'll know where to go from there. The next guideline that we want to look at is the cuboid oblique guideline. Remember what I told you about the cuboid bone and how it sits with the first metatarsal base of the lateral side of the foot. That guideline goes in a diagonal guideline. It's oblique and then it comes right to the bony protrusion of the first metatarsal head and then it comes over. So it's a slight arch and a straight line. Straight line and a slight arch. What's great about the cuboid oblique guideline is the reason I created that was that I wanted to split right down the most prominent reflexes of the midsection of the foot. If you could know what reflexes would come in contact with that line, it would give you a general idea where everything is and what should be separated from that point. Then we know what the cuboid transverse guideline, transverse simply meaning horizontal or across, we come straight across from that same cuboid bone. There's our transverse guideline and below that is what we call the hip sciatic guideline. That one's the easiest because you can see where the plantar pad changes texture and skin. You just draw the line this way. Now I want a slight arch to that guideline. A slight arch. I mean if you drew it straight across I wouldn't penalize you for it, but let's give it a slight arch because that okay, follows. Now we're going to work some of the reflexes that lie in between or on some of the guidelines. Let's start first between the clavicle guideline and the oblique guideline. What we have there is the heart, the pectoral, pectoralis major lungs, ribs, esophagus, bronchioles, and breasts. The way we want to work this particular reflex is between, we, we make a triangle between the cuboid oblique guideline and the clavicle. We get a hold of the, with the holding hand of the toes. Keep that plantar pad of the, of the holding hand right there on the metatarsal heads of two, three, four, and five. Now I'm going to take my working hand, I'm going to take my thumb, and I'm going to start driving into these reflexes between the guideline. Just like, notice how I'm wrenching at the same time? Some will walk slowly. Remember, force, distance, and time. Some will walk slowly. I tend to move a little faster because I think it generates a greater reflex if you move quicker over the surface of the skin. You don't have to be perfect about this. What we don't want to have is a lot of skipping over the skin. Sometimes if the foot is really, really dry, it makes it harder. But we're working right now the heart, pector pectoralis major, the lungs, the ribs, the esophagus, and the abronchioles. If I come directly into here, just on the inside of the spine, it's the sternum. Okay, so we work the sternum. You can use your thumb to work the sternum, or you can work, use your fingers. If I'm driving between these metatarsal heads right here, we are really getting nice and deep. That's also going to help with plantar fasciitis. We're going to keep fluidity to the membrane there. We're, we're going to keep this area fluid. Okay, so that's the heart, pectoralis, ma pectoralis major. I always, always want to call it pec major from weightlifting, but pectoralis major, lungs, ribs, esophagus, bronchioles, and breasts. Now, once I come below that cuboid 
oblique guideline, now we're affecting the adrenal glands, the stomach, and the kidneys. So does it? It really doesn't matter which side of the which foot you're using to make this happen. There's two adrenal glands. One's in the left foot, right foot. We have the stomach crossing both uh, sides of the of the body, and we also have a left kidney and a right kidney, right? So we want to be between the cuboid transverse guideline and the cubi cub cuboid oblique guideline. It's a triangle. And so we're going to work there too. Now notice something I can do here. As I'm working, I can be wrenching simply with my working hand or I can increase by wrenching with the holding hand. So now both hands are working hands. Not simply holding, but both hands are working hands. And we want to cover every aspect of these areas. Now for testing, if I say I want you to work the adrenal reflex, I want to know that you're right in here. Because the adrenal is going to be saddling the kidney, right? Adrenal is going to be saddling the kidney, but stomach is in that area. Most of these reflexes cross each other in certain areas that they're going to cross, like the pancreas is going to be crossing the stomach, okay, adrenal. They're going to be crossing one another. So. I'll make some absurdities on the test and I'll know if you know exactly where these reflexes are. But now why did I create the cuboid oblique guideline? Because I believe that that splits right through where the pancreas reflex is. And that way if I say where is the pancreas, you can go right to that oblique guideline and go bam, there it is. And we know with the pancreas, I also want you to give the spleen. Even though the spleen would be superior to the cuboid oblique guideline, I want the spleen and the pancreas to get credit to be right on that guideline. So I say, what in the left foot is the only reflex to strike through this oblique guideline in the left foot? The answer to the test would be pancreas spleen. Okay? If obviously, if it's in the right foot, what would it be? If it's in the right foot, it's going to be liver, gallbladder. Okay, It's going to strike right through the liver, gallbladder. We have two kidneys. We have two adrenals. We know where they lie. We have two lungs. We know where they lie. But when it comes to the striking through of the guideline in the right foot, if this was the right foot, it would be the liver, gallbladder. If it's in the left foot, it's the pancreas spleen. That makes it real easy because you know if something's superior to the pancreas and spleen, it's the lung. If it's inferior, it'd be the kidney. That makes it really, really easy to remember where things are. Okay? Why did I create the transverse guideline, the cuboid transverse? I wanted to be able to separate the small and large intestine. And I wanted to be able to say right where it was at, which is true. This is anatomically, this is correct. Here's where the transverse colon is. And if we come from the transverse colon, we know that right here would be the splenic flexure. The splenic flexure. The spleen is above, so this would be the flexure that resides close to the spleen. If we're in descending, we can just simply walk down the descending part of the colon. Say we could walk the descending colon. It's real easy. We could do it that way. Or you could raise the foot up and work it this way. You could come across. Hey, that's fine too. You could work transversely. That's all right. Either way, there's many different ways to reach it, but if I say I want to see you working the descending colon, you better not have your, your, your thumb on the right foot. It better be on the left foot working the descending value, or in this case it would be antero-posterior. You could work it up, sure. You could go posterior-anterior. Posterior, anterior. You could go that way, posterior-anterior. But I want to see the thumb in this area. It better not be over here. This is where the descending colon comes. And of course we see the sigmoid flexure is going to be here. Sigmoid flexure is going to be around this area. And just before you get to the knee reflex, this is the knee reflex right in here. Knee for reflex, again drive the thumb all the way through that knee reflex. Come across this sigmoid flexure, that's fine. They kind of overlap one another. It's only fair to say that they would overlap one another. But if I say knee reflex and you're up in here, guess what? You're off, aren't you? Knee reflex is below the hip sciatic guideline. 
So hip sciatic guy line here, transverse guy line here for the cuboid. All intestines should be between these two. Let's say I say work the entire intestinal tract and you're really low. Well, I, I might think you might not know where it's at. So make sure you stand between the right at the hip sciatic guide line where the change of skin is up to the transverse colon. You'll have no problem finding the, the way it is. Now notice I'm just moving my hands around. You know, I'm, I'm di hey, just play with it. You know, you can come across duly. You can work these reflexes all the way up. See how much faster I'm going now? Because I want to cross a certain distance on a specific time. That's going to charge the reflex faster. Yeah, you could go slower, lower. I can pop. So I'm popping my hands. We call that popping. Or I can do this deliberate slow walk. There's so many ways to engage these reflexes. Okay? Now, where is the arm reflex? As we know, it's always on the lateral aspect of either of the two feet. It's going to be all the way down the side. So, to demonstrate that, Lori, give me your right foot so I can show it to the camera. We're going to walk up the arm reflex starting here. You can feel that cuboid notch. That's right where it begins, the cuboid notch. And we're going to work our way all the way up. Okay? That is the arm reflex. We're going to work it all the way up. Now here's the cool part. Right where that notch is down in here, there's a little secret. Right before you get to the arm, there's a softest spot on the right foot only. But there's a soft spot. You'll feel, ooh, see right there, that's soft. That is the illocecal valve appendix. Illocecal appendix. Right there. The illocecal valve is what separates the ilium from the large intestine, the colon. It's a little valve there. And believe it or not, that's exactly where it is anatomically. You hit that little baby, that's a good one to work, especially with people with constipation issues. So, appendix, illocecal. Then we go arm, all the way up, elbow, shoulder. That brings us right to, guess what? The deltoid reflex. You can work the deltoid. See, I'm putting my hand behind here. You can work the deltoid by working the anterior up. Or you could come posterior down, which my hand is blocking the view. Okay. So that's basically all the reflexes and how we work them. There's several different stretching techniques. You want to mix everything in together. You want to make sure that the client stays comfortable. One thing, Lori, let me see your left foot. I want to show you one way getting deeper, getting deeper back into the tissue here. If you dorsal flex the toes, that really exposes everything to where you can get really deep into this tissue. Okay. Now I'm only using the most distal uh, axis of my phalange. It looks like I'm using the flat of my thumb, but I'm not. I'm actually riding right on this part of the thumb, and I'm poking in between these guys as I'm working. See, I'm going in between them. And you can switch hands here. See, I'm using my back of my fingers as the leverage, so I don't even. I'm not even using the holding hand right there. Okay. And you can come across. There's different ways of doing it, but just remember where the guidelines are. Remember where the guidelines are and you'll have no problem in, in figuring out where these specific reflexes are. Now, another thing that I, I didn't bring out is the brain. I want to make sure that when we work the brain reflex, we come right across the top like this. I'm using a rocking motion with my hand. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That's the brain reflex right there. And amygdala brain actually is medial and lateral, but the, this is the total brain reflex right here. And man, let me tell you, that's, a, that's an excellent, excellent reflex to strike. Uh, just as a reminder too, in the intestinal area, we also have the, the uh, not only the small intestine and colon, but we have the bladder, the ureters, the testes, the ovaries, and the prostate all are in the same general area. I don't like getting too specific on the reflexes, even though I may point to one or two, like Ilocecal valve, occipitalis, those kind of, but as a general rule, we want to be in the, the anatomical region of where those reflexes lie, but I don't believe there's a absolute specific spot in the feet. It's just too hard to pinpoint. So as long as we know that all these reflexes lie together and in the general area, then we know what we're doing as reflexologists.
Okay, we're looking at the dorsal side of the foot. To me, the dorsal side of the foot is one of the most overlooked by most other practitioners of reflexology. I find it to be uh, extremely important, especially when it comes to all the back issues. If we look at the body anatomically, the, the dorsal aspect of the foot represents everything from the neck down to the uh, hamstrings. So and even though I don't specifically have a really good reflex for the hamstrings other than the plantar pad, I want to kind of demonstrate how this follows. The trapezius reflexes, as we know, the dorsal aspect, which we call posterior trapezius down, is the toes. But it goes further than that. It actually comes across. If you look at the trapezius muscles on a, uh, on a chart, they look like a kite in the formation of a kite. And that kite comes down at this angle. Actually, well, let's see, I'm doing it in reverse. It may be the opposite, but I'm looking at it backwards. But anyways, it is in the formation of a kite. Take a look at the muscles and realize that the trapezius comes down pretty far and it joins the latissimus dorsi. Latissimus dorsi is all this area here. That's the thick bodied muscle of the back. Or the kind of muscle that the when you see a guy put his hands on his hip, put his elbows out laterally, it spreads like wings. That's the latissimus. That's the big belly. That's the strongest muscle of the back. When we work this whole area here, we're working shoulders, trapezius, and back. Extremely important for people that are under stress. When we come across this groove, right here, you see it's a natural groove. If I dorsal flex, you can see the groove, even, or actually plantar flex, either way. You see that groove? That's the gluteus maximus and the erector muscles. Gluteus, erector, latissimus dorsi, trapezius. This is all the low-lying back of the muscles. Extremely important to work. I work them from medial to lateral, like this. I use just digits one and two, or index finger and digits two. You can do all four if you so choose. It's up to you. But I work medial to lateral on these, and then I'll switch and I'll go back. Okay? We'll go all the way back across, medial to lateral. This can be extremely painful to somebody who's never had this exercise before. There's also another way to work it. You can take the knuckles of your hand like a fist, like you're ready to punch something, and you stick it right between the first and second metatarsal. These bones, between the first and meta second metatarsal, that's a starting point. We bridge our hand up and over the top of the, the most distal aspect of the foot, and we work our way down with the index finger. We switch to the second and third meta, or, uh, metatarsal bones, and we work our way down. We switch to the third and fourth, and we work our way down. Notice the client just kicked a little. That means they're feeling pain. Now, again, between the fourth and fifth, we work our way down. So here's our options, working our way down between the valleys of each and every uh, metatarsal region. Okay, this is an excellent way to strike trape trapezius latissimus dorsi. Or we can come across from medial to lateral doing the same thing. And when you get to a real advanced client, I, I, you can actually flex the foot, wrench it while you're striking. Strike, wrench, strike, wrench. That, see how they're pulling, she's pulling now. She can, that's a lot of pain. But you just come all the way across. So on the test, I want to see the, the, the practitioner's hands come, if I say latissimus dorsi, here. If they're up here, that's trapezius, that would be a fail. Trapezius is up here, latissimus dorsi is here. If I say I want to see you work the occipitalis, we simply work here. Remember, these are general regions. As long as you're close, there's no problem in testing because I want to see your art take place. I want to see your hands all over the place, different directions, countering one another. There, this whole thing of perfect practice makes perfect is a bunch of garbage when it comes to the feet. We want to make sure that you develop the art to reach these reflexes the best way that you possibly can. And that may be so much different than I, but one thing that we will never challenge is the anatomical structure of the body. Okay, the anatomical structure is the same. You can't put the heart in the pelvis. It stays up in the rib cage where it belongs. So when we work these feet, let's stay close as we can to the anatomical structure. Let's drive, use hooking motions, extension and compression. Um, 
Let's do those things, and then we know that we're doing the clients the absolute best. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope the students do well on their testing.